many of you believe uh, God answers long distance prayers? You know, we prayed for our youth and they're like 100 and whatever miles away. You believe God answers those prayers? You know, I, I want to just share with you, uh, three weeks ago, I got back from Pakistan and India with a little stop in Thailand. And before I left, uh, you guys prayed. I don't know if you remember that. And a lot of you prayed while I was there. And the prayer that God dropped in my heart, and, and you know, all prayer is good. But how many of you know really good prayer is when God tells you how to pray? You know, right? I mean, when the disciples, you know, they said, hey, teach us to pray, you know, like John's disciples pray. And Jesus went right into, you know, the greatest prayer ever taught, the Lord's Prayer. And so I was just, you know, God, you know, what, what, what's this trip about? And, you know, just pondering. And then I, I felt like he just dropped in my heart. I want you to pray for spiritual, physical, and emotional agility. Do you remember that? And that was like, man, that's, that's really a good prayer right there. And so I started praying that, and I had my prayer team. I got 10 to 12 people that pray for me regularly. And then we told you, right before I left, the Sunday I left, I said, would you just pray for those things right there? I can tell you God heard those prayers. God answered those prayers. And I, I'm telling you, and I hate to use the word I felt, but I'm going to tell you this. I did feel your prayers. It, it was a weird thing. Uh, let me just show you this map, okay? We're going to get into a little story here in a minute. But this was my itinerary right here, just a little trip around the world uh, that started in San Francisco. And I can, let me tell you, the worst part of any trip in the world is the trip from here to San Francisco airport. I will tell you, the Greek word is hell. The word, Hebrew word is hell. Spanish, hello, I don't know. Uh, it's just bad, man. I, I hate that drive. The rest of it was gravy. So then, you know, you go over here, you flew all night, all night, get into Istanbul, Turkey, have a layover there, leave at night there, go to Pakistan, get to Pakistan, Pakistan, 5.30 in the morning, get to the, uh, get to the hotel, 7.30 in the morning, guy says, I will pick you up at 10 o'clock, 10.30, awesome, go get a few hours sleep, he's there, we drive hours and hours to, to start the itinerary, and let me just say, in, 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 in 19 days, 20 days, because my wife won't let me go for 21 days. She goes, 20 is the limit. So I take it as far as I can right there. 20 days, flew 28,000 miles, 40 hours in airplanes, and drove 1,000 miles. And let me tell you, zero jet lag. Zero jet lag. Now, how many of you know what jet lag is? You felt jet Yeah, I get jet lag. I get it. I come home from these trips, and I typically sleep 13 hours straight. It's bizarre. There was no jet lag. There was no illness. There was no sickness. There was no, you know. You know. There was none of that. No scoots. There was nothing. There was, there was no food poisoning. There was, there was nothing. And, and I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, the whole trip, I'm thinking, I should be exhausted right now, but I'm absolutely exhilarated. And you know what I know? I know it's the prayers of the saints. I know it's the, I know it's the supernatural grace of God that, that was enabled by the prayer of the rock. And then one night, I happened to go, gosh, what time is it? What day is it? Oh, I'm just going to check to see if the service is going. I just happened to catch the window of time that I have to, to check in and go online from Pakistan to see the service. And right when I click on and it starts streaming, Pastor Brandon is praying for me and leading you in a prayer for me in Pakistan and praying for Haiti. And I'm sitting here going, yeah, here I am. I'm here. I'm watching. I'm, you're praying. I receive it. And I'm telling you, it was tangible. So next time you tell somebody, yeah, I'll pray for you, you need to understand it really, 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 really makes a difference. And, and, and so that, that went on, man. And there was airport closures and reroutes and, and, and just the whole nine yards. And I can tell you, after all that, I got home. There was no jet lag. My wife said, I cannot believe, you know, how you're doing. I said, yeah, I'm young, man. What can you say? I'm just a young dude, you know? <laughs> no, it was all the grace of God. So I'm going to share some of the things that went on that I believe wouldn't have gone on had it not been for the prayers of the saints. I just believe that. It would be arrogant to say, I went and did this, and I, I did that, and then this happened. No, man, this is a, you know, rather you and I go or send or give, we're all part of the mission. Is that right? All part of the mission. So with that, let's go to Luke chapter 10. We'll go a little story here. You've heard it a lot of times. Resist the temptation to go, yeah, I know that story. 
No, let's, let's take a look at this with fresh eyes, fresh heart. You know, this word is 2,000 years old, right? Actually, it's eternal, but the printed, you know, it's 2,000 years. But how many of you know that every day this word brings life? To those that will read it, meditate on it, pray over it, believe it, and obey it. So I believe this story right here can really ignite something in our hearts. And we've been talking about kingdom life. Oh, we're already there. Kingdom life, uh, triumphing over tests, right? Did I get that right? Triumphing over tests. Let's talk about the test of love. What? Did I get it? Good enough. Close enough. Okay. How many of you were good test takers? You know, you would get, the test would come, no problem. Yeah, let, hold your hands up. It's okay. Be a little proud. You're not in trouble. How many of you that when you saw the T word, there was like a mild form of paralysis that took over? You just see the T word like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And inevitably, it was like, I, I always studied the things they never asked. What, what, you know? So I'm just here to tell you that I have, I've flunked a lot of tests. I've flunked a lot of spiritual tests. But by the grace of God, he keeps giving the tests. And he gives the answers to the test. And if I'll look for the answers, I can pass in Jesus every test. I like those tests. And this is, this is a great test, the test of love. Nobody nails this test 100 out of 100 because we're human. We miss it. Luke 9 and 10 are two chapters about short-term missions. Really good. And let's look at this story. On one occasion, an expert in the law, so he's pretty smart. He passed a lot of tests. He stood up to test Jesus, to provoke Jesus. You know what the Hebrew is for that? Bad move. That's a bad move. That, that's just a bad move, to stand up and test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's really asking, what do I need to do to have the unending life of God in the presence of God forever and ever? And that's a great question. But his motives are wrong for the ask. In verse 26, what's written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? Verse 27, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what? He, got the, he nailed the scripture memorization. Put a dollar in the jar. He got it. He nailed it. It's good. Verse 28, you've answered correctly. Sweet. Correctly or rightly or orthodox. Ortho, rightly. He's got it. He's biblically sound. He's got it. But Jesus is going to do something to him. You've answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this. Everybody say, do this. Yeah. Not know this. Do this. So he says, he says, do this and you will live. What he's saying there when he says live, you will live, it means that you will really enjoy a fruitful kind of God life in the here and now and a quality of life that will sustain you forever and ever and ever. It is literally the spiritual best life. I mean, we live in such a meme world, don't we? I mean, you can't go on Facebook or Instagram or whatever the other Twitters, and there's memes everywhere. And one of the popular ones is your best life. I even have friends, I have people that will be out doing something, drinking coffee. They'll send me a picture. I'm living my best life. <laughs> part of me, the cynical part of me goes, who cares? <laughs> no, the other part of me goes, that's awesome. But I'm, I'm just thinking, and so people will send me this stuff. I'm living my best life. Let me tell you something. If best life, those two words, are not connected with Jesus' two words, do this, that's not their best life. Well, I want my best life now. Okay, do this now. Okay, that, okay, that's okay. That's fine. You're going to be fine. But he wanted to justify himself. In other words, he wanted Jesus to affirm his righteousness. So he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? You know, the Jews thought this way, that if you're a Jew, then the circle's really tight. And if you're close proximity and Jewish, that's the neighbor. But this guy's wanting to justify himself. He's really, you know, what he's really doing, he's, he's, he's asking, who am I really obligated to love? Who, who am I really responsible for? How far, and, and we all ask this at different times, how far do I really have to go outside of my circle? How far do I go outside of my comfort zone? You know, I had a guy before I left for Pakistan 
took me out to breakfast, and uh, he was working on his final paper for his master's degree in missions. And his paper was on the validity of short-term missions. So he's asking me, and he's, he's saying, you know, how, you know, how valid is short-term missions and, you know, this kind of stuff, and should we do it? I mean, isn't it not a waste of money, but couldn't that money be better spent and all that? You know, and he had all those classical arguments. And, and then I just asked him, I just said, hey, let me ask you a couple questions here. I said, do you have a brother or sister? He says, yeah, I do. I said, okay, if they lived in Sacramento and a neighbor called you and said that they're in desperate need, they don't have any food, would you help them? He said, yeah, of course. I said, okay, if, if your brother or sister lived in Los Angeles, and it was the same scenario, the car broke down, they had to walk three miles to get to work, they were barely making it, would you help them? He said, of course I would. I said, if your brother or sister lived in Haiti, would you send or go or do something for them in Haiti? Of course, he said, and he was a little annoyed, he said, of course I would. He goes, how far are you going to take this? I said, exactly. That's how far, we're going to take it. We're going to keep, I'll tell you what, we're going to take her further than less. That's where, that's where we're going to take it. We're, we're not going to take it lesser. We're going to take it further because that's what Jesus said to do. I mean, he, he said to go. He didn't say, you know, go as, as far as it's comfortable to you or convenient to you. He said go. And you know what's interesting? I'll just, can I just tell you what irritates me a little bit? It's okay. It's a, it's a, can we just chat? Let's, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. When I go on mission trips, a lot of times, somebody will inevitably say this. Well, did you pray about it? I do. I'm tempted. Just, you know. Did you pray about it? I thought, isn't that interesting that that's a lot of people's first response. Well, did you pray about it? You know, and here's my thought. What if we did it the opposite? Rather than pray about it, what if we just obeyed and went and kept going until Jesus said, Stop. Can you do that? I think so. He said go. He, he said go. I didn't say go. He said go. Where did he say to go? The whole world, every ethnic group, every tribe, every tongue. When the Holy Spirit was given and the church was birthed, there was 19 different ethnic groups right there. I think he likes different countries personally. I think he does. So I, my, my thought is, how far do you go? You go until he says stop. This is uncomfortable. See, here's the deal. No, this is awkward. So I go to these countries. I go to Pakistan. I'm sitting there. I'm going, okay, how do I connect culturally with them? I mean, I am a white guy in the sea of Pakistanis, and I know little about their culture, and I'm saying, God, please, just give me a hook. Give me something to connect with them. Give me something that I'm just not some white guy from another country coming there as a guest speaker. Help me connect. And I'm, and I'm praying, and they're getting ready to introduce me. And, and then and God just drops this on me. He drops, he drops Ephesians. I think it's chapter 4. He says, there is one spirit. There is one Lord. There is one faith. There is one baptism. There is one hope. There is one Father who is God of all. And so I would get up and I would say, I would say, I just want to tell you how honored I am to be in your country, how privileged I am to be in your country. And people have prayed that God would open the doors for me to come. And I just want to tell you, and I would quote that verse right there, and I would say, so you know what that means? That means I'm the brother you haven't met yet. And you're my brother and sister that I haven't met yet. And then you would see these smiles erupt on their face. And I'd say, when I go back home, you know what people are going to ask me? Why did you go to Pakistan? And what I'm going to tell them is, because I have brothers and sisters there that I haven't met before that I needed to go encourage and pray for and bless and bring hope to. And, and they were like that. They were like that. And it was like, you know, because at the end of the day, you know what it's not about? It's not about just sending money. I, this is what I'm learning. This is what I believe right now. I believe presence of God's people in places that he's called us to is worth all the money you could send. There is something about looking at somebody in another culture that is in an oppressed situation, that is poor, and you're looking them in the eye, and you tell them God loves you. He has not forgot about you. I'm here. I'm with you. I love you. I want to pray for you. I want to hug you. I want to hold you. I want to do whatever it takes to facilitate the grace of God in your life. And I'm telling you what. Ah. Uh, Incredible. Absolutely incredible. I'm so excited. Got a couple pictures. Here's a couple brothers and sisters you haven't met yet. Maybe. See, you go in. Every place I went was in what they call a Christian slum. 
98% Muslim, 2% Christians. The Christians all live in Christian slums. Poor, gray water, that's raw sewage everywhere, no running water, no toilet, nothing, man. And you come in, and here they are, man, just, just welcoming you, singing songs. I mean, incredible. Give me, give me another slide here. So 10 meetings, five cities, 1,000 miles of traveling. Uh, schedules would get all messed up. Uh, we would be late, not because of me. <laughs> they would, my last name's Hasty. I'm early to everything. They, those guys, man, <laughs> Pakistani time or something, were late everywhere. Some of these people, some of these meetings that we did had waited two and a half hours for us to get there. And they would just worship for two and a half hours. Let me ask you, do you think the atmosphere was ripe? You walk into a room where people have been, you know, worshiping for two and a half hours. You think that was like... Yeah, man. So I would just say, yeah, you're my brothers and sisters. And then there'd be another half the room over there. And, and this was everywhere we went, man. It was just, it was impoverished, God-loving, God-fearing Jesus people that are related to us. And I'm telling you, the more I go, the more we go, the more there's that growing sense of responsibility that we cannot not go. The, the question I always ask myself is, when I go to these countries, I go, if I was, this is some, I'm giving away the whole farm right now. You're welcome. If I was born here in this country, name the country, whatever it is, India, Pakistan, Haiti. If I was born here, I was living in this kind of poverty, in this kind of conditions, in this kind of lack, with a strong faith in God, would I want another Christ follower who is my brother and sister from another country to come and meet with me and be with me and love me? Would I want that? And the question, of course, would you want that? If that was you, so that's the, the compulsion that, that in part just fuels me. Um, yeah, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, and I love this. This is awesome. This is story time with Jesus. This is great. In reply, Jesus said, now remember, this is the guy that wanted to justify himself in his righteousness. Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. I just love that. <laughs> the only thing that's missing is the flannel board, man. Jesus is just in there. We're going to tell a little story here. It's a little story time. This is a parable, okay? But it's going to smack these guys down. <laughs> so a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's called the bloody way, okay? So it's a 25-foot, it's a maybe 30-foot path back then that had a 3,000 elevation drop over the course of 17 to 20 miles. So there's a lot of clefts. And it was just known as the Bloody Way, where there was a lot of robbers, a lot of thieves. You never went there by yourself. Uh, there was just robbery, pil pilferages. All, I mean, just everything was happening on this place. And so Jesus, when he's telling this, they know. They know, okay? That road, we know that road. So he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. Now, when I read this, what jumped out to me was that this really is a representation or a picture of a lot of the world. Now, you would agree you're privileged, wouldn't you? No, I mean, you kind of get that, don't you? Like, I, I got it pretty good. I, I don't really, you know, wherever you live, trust me, you've got it good. I don't know if it's most of the world. I don't want to go global stats on you, but most of the world doesn't live like this. So... When I looked at this verse, I thought, this represents really a lot of the world. Attacked, stripped, beaten, left for dead, and nobody really caring. You know, in Pakistan, you know what they call Christians? Here's, here's the common phrases or slangs for Christians in Pakistan. They're the lowborns. Lowborns. They're the filthies. That's what I call them. So most of the Christians... Christians are in villages outside of the main population, and they're just off, way off by themselves. And the, most of the time, they have to walk quite a long ways to get even water. And so they're the, they're the lowborns, the filthies, the sweepers, because the only jobs that Christians can get in that country have to do with sanitation and garbage. So they sweep streets, they shovel crap, they work in sewers. That's, that's their lot in life right there. And then there is this term. Okay, you've heard the term untouchables. Okay, that's low caste systems in different places where you just don't go near them, you don't touch them. And that's true there too. But then there's also a word to describe them. The Pakistan Christians are called, called unseeables. 
So these are people that are so not regarded that people don't even, they don't even look at them. Like, go off and go to the slum. Live in the slum. We don't, we don't, there, we don't want any interaction with you. And, and this beaten guy, I mean, this, this kind of, you know, uh, does something here. Did 10 meetings, five days, Average, uh, smallest meeting was 50, 60. Biggest meeting was three something, 300. You just never knew what you were going to get. And the last night, they said, hey, the last night, we want to drive out to this village. And would you minister to drug addicts? I said, of course. My gosh. They take me out to this place. And we get in this kind of city, little city. And there's a river running right through the middle of it. And... From a distance, I'm thinking, wow, that's cool, river right through the middle of it. But as we got closer, the stench of stew- sewage was overwhelming. It was like, I said, what is that, man? The guy goes, that's raw sewage. So it was a canal of raw sewage that went through the middle of this town. And now it's winter, and it was like 43, 44 degrees, and I had to do this. I had to breathe like this as I was walking down the road because it was so, you know, you, know, you ever get that gag thing before you're ready to throw up? You know that, you know that thing? That thing was there. And so I'm like, oh, I'm breathing. He goes, you should see it in the summer. He's 110, 115 degrees and all that stuff heats up. He goes, you can't, it's unbearable. I'm thinking, sign me up. No, I mean, it's that's where these people live, and that's how they're regarding the last meeting, the last meeting of the trip. And I'm just flying high. We get to these, you know, people who struggle with drugs and alcohol, and, and we start praying. I said, let's pray. I give my testimony, share a few scriptures. I said, let's pray. And then yeah, these guys come forward, and this one guy comes forward, and he's an older guy, man. He's weathered. He's got the lines. The translator says, he wants you to pray for him because he relapsed on cocaine. I said, oh, absolutely. And so I started to pray for him, and his head just went just down. And, and it was, I mean, it was so awesome because when you're walking in the grace of God, you know that there is nothing this guy can do to perform for God, to earn anything from God. He is a mere recipient of the grace and mercy of God. And so I didn't, once again, I, I, I'm, I'm flying blind. I don't know what's appropriate. So I grab the guy's chin and I go, I go, look at me. He's crying. He keeps trying to put his head down. And I said, Jesus is the glory and the lifter of your head. He never wants to push your head down. He always wants to lift your head up. And he's forgiven you. You've repented. He's forgiven you. He wants to set you free. He kept trying to put his head down. Man, I just grabbed his chin. thinking, man, I hope this is appropriate. And I'm just like, you know, it's just, well, I was getting a little bicep work out there. I was like, come on, man. But it's like just begging for this guy to be free. Awesome. And you went there with me. Verse 31, this is this where it gets really interesting here. A priest happened to be going down the road, and he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now, you know what's interesting is that the priest and the Levites are the officers of God's people in the temple and are responsible for mitigating by the law and giving to the poor. That's their responsibility. And Jesus uses these two groups of religious officials and says, and they saw it. And here's what, it, here's what, here's what the word saw. I love the little word saw. It doesn't mean they just kind of saw him. It, it, it literally means that they, they saw him. They paid attention to what was going on. They observed what was going on. And then they just they moved on. Both of them. Now, when you go 0 for 2 on religious leaders... That's not, that's not good for God. And so you know what Jesus? Jesus does the absolute unthinkable. Both these guys, you know, they pass by. Uh, here's what keeps... You ever heard of the golden rule? <laughs> it's like whatever you want men to do to you or for you, do for them also. I think it's a no-brainer, man. I, I just think that's a grid. That's a filter we have to think globally and locally. In our church, we are members of the household of faith. I wrote down in my journal, you know, over there, after the Ephesians 1, you know, one Lord, one family, brothers and my sisters, we are of the household of faith. And, and, and I wrote this, we're a part of a really big house. We are part of a really, really big spiritual house around the world. I don't want to be a guy that passes by. You know, they took the easy, the easy way. Don't look. I won't get convicted. You know, just keep moving. We do that. How many of you ever passed by? 
You got convicted. Do something. You went la, 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 la. You ever do the la, la? Yeah. I have too. That this is so convicting. Old story. New conviction. I'm compelled. I'm compelled to bring people with me. Um, I did a terrible thing. Um, this was bad. At least my wife said it was bad. So when I'm over there, I, I grab some books for this guy. His, his sister sends some books. I grab some books. I see Pastor Francis's book, A City That Looks Like Heaven. I just feel like I should bring that book. So I bring the book. I give the guy nine books. He's a voracious reader. He reads that book first. He reads it in one day. He starts reading it the second day. We get together. He goes, oh. First he texts me, middle of the night, three in the morning. I love this book. This is a great book. I love this book. Next day he tells me, oh, I love that book. So I go, ah, let's snap a picture. I'll send it to Francis. So he holds the book up, send a picture, and he goes, can we get this translated in Urdu? I said, absolutely. <laughs> Remember, it's all yes until I hear no. So I say, yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so I send it to Francis. I said, hey, this guy loves your book. He goes, oh, that's so exciting. That's awesome. Then I send him another one. Uh, I said, hey. He wants to translate it into Urdu. So I told him we'd do that. So we gotta get, you got to get to work on this whole thing. He goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. He goes, that book was written, you know, specifically for Sacramento. I said, really? I said, well, give me the five principles uh, of the book. And he goes, that, 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 that. I said, is that good for every church? He said, yeah. I said, is that good for every country? He said, yeah. I said, well, I think you should translate it. And then I said, you know, or you could just go on a cruise ship and Take a lap with Susie, drink your Starbucks, call it good. If, I mean, if that's what you want to do, I mean. It's bad. It's bad. That is really bad. Now, fortunately, we have a great relationship. And he knows when I'm ribbing him. My wife looks at me and she goes, that's nothing more than manipulation. So I, I stared her down. I said, I know. Blink, I dare you. Blink, you blink for. I'm not blinking. She goes, no, it's manipulation. I said, yeah, but it's spirit-led man manipulation. So I get a call a few days later. He goes, okay, I was only one percent excited when you started talking to me. I I'm 55 percent. And then his wheels. You know Francis. Whoa, the wheels start turning. So I leave him that little caveat. I say, you can golf, hit the white ball. That's good. It's all good, Francis. That's what you want to do. I said, or you can change a nation. That's bad. I'm confessing. That's so bad. And then, and then, and then he, goes, he goes, well, okay, so how are we going to get the book there? I said, mules. <laughs> you and me, man. We're going to load up some suitcases. And then he says this. He goes, okay, now. So if I did that, I'm not saying I'm going to, but if I did that, then we'd have to go see Anthony and Anu in India, right? I said, now you're starting to get it. You're starting to get the vision, Francis. You're starting to get the vision for this thing right here. That's so horrible. He's such a good man, and he's anything but retired. You know that. But, you know, anyways, that's bad. Don't do that. Don't try that at home. But you know what? I want to get people to go. I, want to get, I hope when I'm 70, somebody doesn't go, how's your golf game? I hope they go, what country are you going to next? I don't care about my golf game. It's been tanking for 14 years. Actually, it's been tanking since I moved here. So I don't think it's, there's any change soon. Okay, let's talk about some reasons why people don't love and engage the lost and the marginalized. Okay, here we go. Five, I said reasons. I was being polite. Five reasons people don't. Five excuses. Um, number one, laziness. Lazy people don't want their comfort messed with. Laziness means slothful, sluggish, dull, relaxed, and withdrawn. Oh. Let's do nothing. Let's relax. That's a lot of work. Yeah, no kidding. It's a lot of work. Getting on those airplanes, a lot of work. My back hurts. Everything hurts. Or I could be lazy and relax. I, I don't want this. Here's a, here's a terrible quote. Ready for this one? Sloth. Everybody say sloth. sloth. That sounds horrible. Sloth is the sin which believes in nothing, cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, loves nothing, hates nothing, 
finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, only remains alive because nothing is worth dying for. Right? That's a reason, though. People don't do this. People don't, you know, those guys were spiritual and lazy at the same time. Ceremonial and slothful. That's a reason. Number two, hard hearts. What's a hard heart? Unfeeling. That's what, you get callous. You get indifferent. You preoccupied. I get preoccupied with my needs, my space, my boundaries, my relationships, my security, my future. Ugh. Hard heart. Get a hard heart. You know that, once again, that quote, man, just drives me nuts a couple years ago. And Craig will help me if I forget it, because sometimes I forget it. But it's if you continue to view poverty and suffering from a distance, it will become tolerable to you. God, that's not what Jesus said. Look at the broken, lost, and needy, and let it be tolerable to you. Hard heart. I don't want a hard heart. You know, a lot of people, you know what they say? Here's, here's the reasoning. How many of you ever failed at an exercise program? You say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And you, and you waited for the motivation, right? You waited until you saw the right little video, and that's it. I'm going now, man. You know, we, we always want Americans. We want the feeling first, the motivation first. But this sequence in Matthew 9 that describes how Jesus did it, I think, is what we really got to own for ourselves. It says, and Jesus went. Everybody say went. What happened when he went? It says, he went, and then he saw. He went, then he saw, then he was moved with compassion. Notice it doesn't start with feelings. It starts with obedience. It starts with going. Feelings come in the obedience, and then it says, and then he healed the sick. You know what? I'll, man, lose the whole, I need to feel like it to go minister to people. Lose the whole, I want to be motivated. I want to be stirred. No, just go do it. Find yourself in the middle and go, I'm in over my head. God said, okay, finally, you're in over your head. Now I can show up and you can know forever. It's not you doing this. Sorry, I got a little, little passion there. A little, little passion. You know, when I was there... Um, Man, I had words that would come right in the middle of my preaching. And it was like, I'd be preaching this message, and, and all of a sudden it's like, pray for this, stop and pray for this. I'm thinking, can you do this? Should you do this? Shouldn't we wait till an altar call? And so I'm preaching, and, and all of a sudden I get, pray for hard hearts. I'm thinking, I don't, can you do this? I'm going, I'm going to pray. And the guy's going, yeah, yeah, go, 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 go. I said, hey, I just want to pray for you. If you have a hard heart right now, I want you to raise your hand, stand up. I don't even know if you can do this. I said, Say it, 35, 40 people, a couple different places, just stood up. Man, I just go. I'm there for three weeks. I don't really care. Not three weeks. First week. I go there. I just lay hands on everybody. Take time. Take time. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Pray for them. Get done. I said, how many of you actually felt something break in your heart right there? And I was like, almost 100% raised their hands. Afterwards, I asked the guy. I go, now, are they just giving me kind of a courtesy? You're a foreigner guy. Like, yeah, yeah, it was all good. No, no. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Our culture doesn't acknowledge weakness publicly. I said, then that's a Big stinking deal. Third one. No, yeah, third one. Busyness. In fact, oh, let me tell you the story. Can I tell you the story? We're good on time. Forget about it. Oh, wait a minute. No. Okay. All right. I know, right? When I was praying for hard hearts, when I was praying for hard hearts, okay, we get done. A lady comes up and says, when you prayed, I saw fire come twice. You know what that was? I have no idea. I have no idea. I assume it was a good thing. But once again, it's like, if my heart's not sensitive, if, you're not, if people aren't praying for me, my heart might not be as sensitive that in that moment to make that read. I mean, there's a lot at stake here. Third, third one. Busyness, cares of this world, choke the word. How many of you are busy? You're an American, I already know that. Don't even need a prophetic word. You're an American, I'm busy, we're busy. I get that, but that, this is a reason we don't, we don't do what Jesus says to do. We don't take the time for people. Jesus equated distractions with busyness. We're distracted. 
I'm so busy, I can't be interrupted. I used to hate interruptions. This nugget, though, really helped me. Jesus was interrupted 18 different times in the Gospels. Each time led to a miracle. Look at how many times he was interrupted on the last days before the cross. Go look that up, and you'll see that he was interrupted a lot, and there was a lot of blessings that were given as a, as a result of the interruptions. You know, as I, I was there, and I was thinking about all the interruptions, because there's a million of them, it hits me that interruptions are just disguised as divine, divine appointments. You know, there's praying for this one guy. He comes up, and once again, there, they're so hungry. People just come, pow, pow, pray, pray. I start praying for this guy. And I start praying for him. I, man, just get the word. Man, you're called to be a leader. Boom, I launch into him. And all of a sudden, this girl just gets right in between him. Like, you know, tries to steal the prayer. It's like, what the heck? But it's like I said, okay, whatever. She's desperate. So I start praying for her. I get the same thing. It's like, whoa, hey, you're called into leadership too. I don't know that they're brother and sister. I have no idea. So I start praying for her. And she goes into this trance-like thing. So I put my hands on it start praying for her. And she starts going. And she sits, just kind of collapsed on the chair. And I'm praying. And the guy, you know, my buddy, he goes, he goes, what's happening? I said, have no idea. <laughs> Start praying. And as I'm praying, you know, there's part of me that wants to go into, I've got to discern this. I've got to discern the moment. I've got to know exactly what this is. And you know what? And then I'm reminded of something a mentor friend of mine in Singapore told me a couple years ago. He says, you need to celebrate the I don't knowness of God. So I didn't know what was happening in the moment. What I did know in the moment that my love is greater than whatever she's trying to overcome right there. My faith that I have right now, the prayers of the saints back home, the prayers that we're praying right now are greater than whatever this little thing is. Now, here's the deal. So I pray, and you just move on. There's hundred people, man. You're just praying. Is it next night or two nights later, all of a sudden, the guy grabs me, and he goes, he goes hey, do you remember her? And this girl, and it's like, yeah, that's the girl, that girl. And I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. She looked like she came off the Mount Transfiguration. Her, her face, her countenance was lit up. I'm thinking, I so just want to take my phone. I mean, I so wanted to grab, snag a shot, man. I mean, it was like amazing. Oh, all right. Busyness. Interruptions. Divine appointments. Okay, so there's this little war that almost breaks out. Pakistan shoots down an Indian jet over Pakistan. Coming home from Islamabad, back to the hotel, 3 in the morning, 50 to 100 tanks, heavy artillery rolling down the road. It's like, shnikey, man. This is like, wow, this is, they're going to the border. It's the pilot that got captured from the shot down plane, 30 miles from where I was at. So this is, you know, this is alarming. So they shut down the airport, but no problem because I'm not leaving for a few days. And so then it opened up for a day or two. And then the day I was supposed to leave, they shut the airport down again you know, for security. Hotel I'm staying in has a evacuation drill. That was kind of fun. Um, so they shut down the airport. And then, and then, so my travel agent calls me up. He goes, hey, you know, you got, got some little problems there. I go, mm, yeah, I kind of know. He says, uh, we, you got to try to get out on this plane here. He says, you can't get out on your same airline to go to Bangkok because you can't fly over India airspace because we're going to meet Gunnar Preston and Emily from China in Bangkok for three days. He says, you can't go that way. So Thai Airlines is booked for a week out. So I'm telling the guy, my buddy there, and he goes, this is awesome. He goes, we can do more meetings. <laughs> I mean, he was like blood in the water at Shark Week. I'm not even kidding, man. He's like, oh, keep it closed, Lord. Keep it closed. <laughs> so they booked me on Oman Air. And the day it opens, it opens at 1 o'clock. There's only one flight that makes it out that day. Whose flight is it? All the other flights got canceled. Not only that, but my travel agent calls me up. He's in Kenya on a mission trip. <laughs> he calls me up, kind of wacky. He calls me up. He goes, he's a Russian guy. He goes, well, Bob, you know, I couldn't get you any uh, regular uh, seats on the airplane, so I had to book you first class. I said, <laughs> he goes, you have travel insurance, so it's no problem. I said, no problem. See ya. Ooh. Please don't cancel this flight. Please don't cancel this flight. So I get on the airplane, and it's funny because they sent me the new itinerary, and it was Muscat. You're going to Muscat on the way to Bangkok. How many of you know where Muscat is? I didn't think so. You know where Muscat is. One person, one person last service knows where Muscat is. I don't know where Muscat is. I'm like, I'm thinking, 
So I started heading to my phone to find out where I'm going. You know, where is this? And there's a four-hour layover. So I started going. I go, no. I said, no, I don't want to know. I want to get on an airplane where I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> that would be exciting. So I didn't know where I was going. So I didn't even find out. I got on the airplane, first class. Oh, God. Would you like some Perrier? Oh, yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hasty, what would you like for dinner? Um, I'll take the lamb. Okay, wise choice. Thank you. Huh. Massager in the chair. Huh. Huh. How much do they pay for this kind of stuff? This was, it was really spellbinding. It was amazing. So, land in Muscat, and I asked the flight attendant, you know, I go, uh, hey, I got a funny question for you. She goes, there's no funny questions. I said, really? I said, what country am I in? She said, are you serious? I said, totally serious. I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> she starts laughing. I said, I told you that was funny. She goes, you're in Oman. I said, that doesn't help. <laughs> Muscat, Oman. I have no idea where I'm at. She goes, you're in a Saudi Arabian country. I said, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, you Americans, very funny. <laughs> so, I like, so I get there. I'm in this airport for four hours. I'm thinking, okay, once again, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm already supposed to be in Bangkok. So I'm there, and all of a sudden, there's a flight that gets canceled with a bunch of people from uh, Iran that were working in Oman, and they start gravitating towards me. So I start, you know, I'm a friendly guy. So I start talking, very broken English. They start asking me questions. You know, one guy says, I'm a Sufi Muslim. I said, awesome, I'm a Christian. I believe that God sent Jesus to die for my sins. He was buried on the third day. He arose, the Spirit of God lives in me. I mean, just went into it, and he's kind of going, I think you're a very good man. I said, sometimes. Sometimes I am. It was good. And then I asked him this. Oh, I just got it. No, should I tell you this? I just wanted to know. I, I asked these guys that were there. I said, can I just ask you a question? What, what do you think of our president? I did, I did. Oh, I'm on a roll. I was on a roll. I just said, I, I just thought, what do you know? And you know what they said? We love Trump. I went, really? And then they said, then they said, we, we, we want to have asylum in America. I said, oh. So I gave them your number, so they're going to they're gonna call you. That was kind of interesting. I thought, wow, what is that? So I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the, I'm in the airport, and they're surrounded. So I start talking, and, and I start giving my testimony to the girl. I said, I, I said are, you, are you a Sufi Muslim too? And she says, no, I'm an atheist. I said, no, you're not. You're not an atheist. No way. I'm just coming off, you know, Pakistan high, man. And I'm going, no, you're not. Eileen, and you are not. She's 28 years old. I said, you are not an atheist. I said, look around. Look at this country. Look at, look at the world. Look at the creation. Did you tell me that's by accident? Are you really serious? Mm, well, no, I, can, you know, I guess you're right. I said, see, I moved you from an atheist to you're called an agnostic, where you don't know. You might be sure. Anyways, launched it, gave her my testimony. And then it hits me. I don't know what time my plane's leaving. Because it's in military time. And I'm really bad with that whole thing. You know, it's like, oh, 1,300, So I, I take my ticket. I go, hey, what time does my plane leave? She goes, now. Your plane is leaving right now. I go, really? So pack everything. Bless you guys. See you guys. Nice meeting you. See you on Instagram. Start, start. <laughs> I start running. I don't even know what gate I'm going to. So I'm just like running through the airport, and I look at the big screen. Uh, B-55. Oh, gosh. Whoa. Hoof it down there. Last third of the plane is loading. I had 10 minutes. I had 10 minutes. You know what the point is? That was an interruption. That was a divine appointment. I gave my testimony and the gospel, John 20 and 21, to people that have never heard Jesus. Never look, at in, never look at interruptions again, ever, 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 ever. Okay, third and fourth reason, fourth and fifth reason why we don't do this. Fear. Might get hurt. Might get sick. It's real. Might get caught in some kind of conflict, some kind of war. Uh, I, bl I, I found a blog before I went. I thought it would be helpful. 70 things to know before you go to Pakistan. 70. One of the first things was, you will get sick. Wow, I'm comforted. You will get sick. Just deal with it. You're going to get sick. Don't fight it. Don't try to avoid it. You're going to get sick. That's just the way it is. I went, wow, I'm encouraged. But there's that fear. It can be real, you know? Um, yeah, travel sickness, all that kinds of stuff. Your circadian rhythm gets all whacked out. Fear is an absolute real thing. It's interesting that a couple of the meetings, there was two or three meetings that I was preaching on one thing and just the word in the text had nothing to do with what I was talking about, but I felt led to stop right there. Stop and pray. And once again, went into prayer. I said, how many of you are paralyzed by fear right now? And now I'm getting bolder and bolder as time goes on. And fear, and bam, people raise up, stand up, 35, 40 people. 
laid hands over all of them, boom, 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 asked him, how many of you feel like you got broke free from that fear? If it wasn't 99%, it was 100%. Every, every one of them said something tangible happened. One girl said she had been visited in a dream by a ghost woman and hasn't slept for two weeks. Now, I don't know what a ghost woman is, but it doesn't sound good, and she was terrified and paralyzed, prayed for her, and she got free. She came up afterwards and says, I want to make a little video to show you. So I got a little video of her. I mean, it's like unbelievable. Listen, the gospel is risk. Sharing Jesus is risk. Faith is risk. Missions is risk. Stopping for a guy that's beaten on the side of the road is risk. But you know what? I, do you really want to play it safe? Yeah. Do, you, do you really want to play it safe with your Christian life? I don't. I don't. I had a morbid thought. I do not want to die a slow, painful death of small world. I don't, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to be, get older and then everything shrinks down. No, man, the older I get, I want to go, 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 go. And if the back's bad, you know, put some rods in there or something. Just get me going. I, don't, I, don't, I do not want it. You know what I'm saying? It's terrifying, man, to think that one day my world could get so small that I just go to church on Sunday. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'll just tell you that right now. Number five is excuses. You know what the biggest excuse for people going to these places is? What difference can I really make? And then they follow it up with this. Why don't you just send money? Answer, Jesus didn't say to send money. He said to go. Sending money is the easy way out. Sending money is like, who do you send it to? Where do you send it? How do you know it's legit? Where are you sending it? You know, part of this trip wasn't just to do mission stuff and, do, and to do ministry. It was to find out the legitimacy of the people and the church that I've been preaching to over the, over the Internet for the last five months to see if this guy was a legitimate leader. And I can tell you he is. So, despite all that, my wife said, now you're not planning on going back anytime soon, are you? I said, no, <clears throat> September. Um, <laughs> no, there's a compelling, man. When Paul said, I am compelled to bring the gospel, I am compelled, love compels me. I, I just can't tell you, the only way I can describe it is you're going to a place that's not on the radar, you don't sign up for these places, but there's an invisible hand that's got you by the shirt that is gently pulling you, and you know that there is nothing you can say or do to get out of that grip, and that's God's grip. It's the grip of love, it's the grip of compassion, it's the grip of conviction, and, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you know what? I, I, I resolved in my, in my mind, and this is going to sound horrible, this is going to sound rebellious, maybe even a little crazy, but there was a point where I knew so much that I'm supposed to go that if my wife said, don't go, I would go anyways. If Pastor Brandon said, don't go, I'd have snuck out the back door. Now, the only way, once again, you can take that any way you want it. I'm just telling you, when this is going on, you can't resist that. You're going to resist that? I'm not resisting that. I'm sitting over there in the middle, like this close to the Af Afghan border, Afghanistan. I'm thinking, what am I doing here, man? I'm the only white guy I've seen in like a long time. <laughs> but the good thing was, remember I grew the beard so I would blend in? So one lady said, what, what country are you from? I said, where do you think I'm from? She said, Japan. <laughs> yeah, I'm Japanese. <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's wrap it up. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled. You know, Samaritans were hated by the Jews. I won't go into all the reasons. They're just hated, despised. In fact, they called Jesus bad word. They called him a Samaritan. See, in John 4, John 8, remember that? They said, you're a Samaritan and you're demon-possessed. So when Jesus says this, you need to understand this is a high challenge part of the story. Religious people, religious Jews are not liking this part of the story right here. Samaritan. He saw him, took pity on him, went and bandaged his wound, wounds, pouring on oil, wine, put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the end, took care of him. You know, the, the amazing thing is the least likely of the three is the one that did God's will. Verse 35, next day, took out two denarii, months worth of wages, gave it to the innkeeper, Said, when I return, look after him. I'll reimburse for any extra charges. Verse 36, Jesus, I love this. So, which of these three do you kind of suppose was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? <laughs> I love that. 
The expert in the law replied, replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Isn't that awesome? A Samaritan. I love the fact that to help us in our journey, let's all stand up together. To help us in our journey, there are over 2,000 verses on the poor, the marginalized, the widows, the orphans, uh, people have been exploited. So you can't go very far in scriptures without seeing that. And Jesus tells this marvelous parable, marvelous story. It says this is the condition people are in. Here's the religious responses. Here's an unlikely person to respond in a great biblical way. And that is the same opportunity you and I have all the time. Now, make no mistake. I can't tell you which country to go to. I can't tell you how many countries to go to. I can't tell you how often you should go. I can't tell you how much you should pray or give. But I do know that every person in this room is called to have a heart for the world. So I'm praying whatever I got is infectious to you. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, and I would like prayer partners to come forward because I'm hoping there's going to be enough conviction to where you go. I can go out the back door or I can go to the front. And so I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we would respond in our heart, God, to your heart, to your word that says go and do likewise, that you would open our understanding, you'd tenderize us with compassion, God, and we would have a heart to go to the less fortunate around the world and bring the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to people that have not experienced it before. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.